I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land on which we gather is the traditional uh, territory of the Piscataue and Pamunkke people. Today it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. I respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future in our ongoing relationships with the indigenous and other peoples within the Washington, D.C. community. Hello and welcome to the session on iconography in Mesoamerica. My name is Catherine Florence, and I am the executive director of the Canadian Latin American Archaeology Society. The people in this room are some of the brightest, and their work is promising for our field. I'd like to begin this session with my own presentation. I'd like to share some big ideas with you about art and polity identity, as expressed through the symbolic war between two animals. You see, from the first indications of collective identity in the Olmec lowlands, the jaguar was the iconographic king of the Mesoamerican world. Its pelts were the symbol of rulership, draped over the shoulders and hips of the urban center lords. It was the unquestioned king of the city and jungle. But then, with the establishment of Teotihuacan, the feathered serpent arrived to challenge the jaguar to that throne. And today, I'm going to show you how the image of the feathered serpent was created as an icon of identity and played a central role in establishing one of the largest urban centers in the hemisphere, Teotihuacan. But to lay out some groundwork, the way I see it, art is not, nor has it really ever been, a mere reflection of the society that bore it. Art is a medium of communication, a mode for us to convey emotions, ideas, and events. It was a means for people to express who they were in their own terms of form, color, and narrative. And this game of identity is played through tactics of opposition and assimilation. Therefore, the choices of what is opposed and what is assimilated offers insight into the construction and preservation of group identity. The avian serpent represented the polity of Teotihuacan, at least as my work shows, and the unity that set it apart from its neighbors, both in political organization but also in the understanding of that identity, that belonging. The association between Teotihuacan and the opposing polities was further expounded upon through the feathered serpent's interaction with jaguar iconography from contemporary states. The city used the icon of the avian serpent and the city itself as a counter monument to this dominant established jaguar iconography which served as the canon for power and rulership in Mesoamerica. By studying this interaction between jaguar and feathered serpent on symbolic monuments, we can derive a new narrative of resistance and identity in ancient Mexico. So, let's set up the contenders, shall we? In one corner is jaguar, Phyllis onica, and it is the largest wild cat in Middle America dwarfing pumas, ocelots, margays, and jaguarondi. It could race across the forest floor, swim through river currents, and leap from branch to branch through the high canopy. It was the apex hunter, passing silently through the night and striking suddenly from the shadows like a flash of lightning. And to be quite honest, I wouldn't want to fight this thing! <laughs> It's no wonder, then, that pre-classic symbolic canons associated the jaguar with physical, magical, and social power. And we have evidence of this association between jaguars and lords as far back as the Olmec in the Gulf Coast lowlands. This precipitated in were-jaguar motifs, like Altar 5 in La Venta, or just depictions of jaguars such as here on Chalcatzingo Monument 41. A few scholars have proposed that early societies of Mesoamerica prescribed to Nahualism, the belief that certain humans had the ability to transform themselves into such animals and control the forces of nature associated therein. And in this paradigm, only the most incredibly powerful could transform into their spiritual counterpart. And moreover, 
the control of these supernatural forces tied directly to leadership. You see, the supernatural realm is perceived as a hierarchy, just like the natural world. So in this grading system, the jaguar inhabits the highest rung and is seen as the most prestigious Nahual. And therefore, they belong to the leaders of the community, or the priests. David Grove also proposes that the major theme of where jaguar monuments is rulership, lending credence to my interpretation. So it should be obvious now that the jaguar ruled the jungles and the imagination of pre-classic people, but it must be kept in mind that their world was full of such supernatural creatures. So now we go to the other side of the ring, and we're faced with a real nobody. Before 100 BC, avian serpents held little to no status within the pan-Mesoamerican religion. Uh, here's a formative period example from uh, La Venta, Monument 15. Not exactly contemporary with Olmec, but close. See, this serpent, as well as uh, examples of uh, cave-painted serpents from the Guerrero region, as we'll see on the next slide, were somewhat associated with clouds and caves, but these connections were far from certain. It had some role as a messenger between the upper, middle, and underworlds, but in general their appearances are few and far between. So to compare them with the Teotihuacano feathered serpent, it becomes evident that these are quite different creatures. The feathered serpent held multiple roles within Teotihuacan. It was the master of time itself, as a snake sheds its skin to become young again, and along with it would be the year. It soared through the sky, bringing rain to the parched land. Its feathers were the most vibrant green, and its teeth were sharper than obsidian, both of which sustained the center's trade networks. And, like the warriors that protected the population, it was precious and lethal all at once. But if <laughs> that's not enough evidence for you, I have the math to prove it. I'll spare you a walkthrough of the processes of an attribute analysis as attested through multivariate analysis of variance with Bernoulli parameters. It took me a year to learn it. I'm not going to fit this into a 20-minute presentation. So, to keep it simple, p-values are a numerical cutoff line for probability. So, if we were to randomly sample the 188 artifacts my original test was on, this is the probability that we would pull out a sample that would have the combinations of attributes we're looking at. That would be a fanged maw, a crested brow, feathered body, and a forked tongue. Now, do that 10,000 times, or in my case, have a computer do it. If we have a decimal probability, that usually means there's a causal effect, effect at play. It's not random, not by chance. So this is a PCOA chart, which is essentially a 2D snapshot of what is actually a 3D model representing those 10,000 tests. Each point represents multi-dimensional clusters of data. The further apart these points are, the less similar they are. And this separation of clusters between serpents and feathered serpents means that there are two distinct forms. Essentially, that serpents are different morphologically in terms of these four attributes from feathered serpents. Now, this might seem redundant, but in statistics, you can assume nothing and must test everything. So then I did this again, comparing the forms between periods, as in before Teotihuacan, during Teotihuacan, and after Teotihuacan. The feathered serpent, in the way it was shown at the site, essentially didn't exist before, and then it became the standard after its conception. This figure meant something to the people living here. It was the branding of Teotihuacan. 
and just look at the sight. Its face is literally everywhere. And my theory is that Teotihuacan curated the image of the feathered serpent as an iconographical opposition to the jaguar of the Maya Haas, the Maya rulers. So now for the fun part. We get to see them fight. <laughs> this is the last chart, I promise. So 188 artifacts were compiled and analyzed, picked from diff various Mesoamerican cultures across 3,000 years, and then evaluated through relative frequency. Essentially, each artifact was labeled according to group, whether it was a serpent, which included feathered serpent, jaguar, a composite of jaguar and feathered serpent, or just the presence of jaguars and serpents together. Relative frequency was calculated by giving a value 1 for each century that the artifact dates to, which allows us to account for date ranges. Then dividing that value by the total instances of presence of the group. Relative frequency gives us a better idea of presence and volume over time. So that's why this chart's important. And from this, we found three main trends. One, before 100 BC, jaguars were the most popular animal to be depicted. It's all blue. And as shown before, there's a definitive lack of formalized avian serpent imagery before 100 BC. So that leads us to point number two. That serpents, while in the minds of Mesoamerican populations long before Teotihuacan grew to a point of influence, it wasn't until the polity comes into power that there's an explosion of feathered serpent iconography. That triangle of red gets bigger as we go up in date, showing an increase in volume. And three, there's a startling boom of artworks that host both jaguars and avian serpents, which coincides with a tumultuous period in Teotihuacan's history, around 700 AD. Now, this might signify a reality of political antagonism. Well, it's understandable because the rise of Teotihuacan proposed, op proposed two opponents to the other polities in Middle Continent. For one, it was a major power in the valley, controlling trade and resources. And two, the feathered serpent stood as a direct challenge to the authority of the jaguar in the supernatural cosmology. So, understandably, this did not go over well with the Ha-led polities. In the art, we see instances of avian serpents poised in victory, like at Teotihuacan. But more commonly, there are retaliatory images, painted by sites attempting to suppress the rebellious notions that Teotihuacan had planted, wherein the jaguar dominates. Like here at Kashkala, where jaguar pelt-clad warriors don't just defeat feathered combatants, they outright obliterate them. It suggested that those who left Teotihuacan during its decline carried their icon with them. The feathered serpent took up nests at other sites, usually those allied with Teotihuacan in some way. Therefore, it is with certainty that we can conclude that these artworks were more than just re mere renditions of cosmological beliefs, but political statements of affiliation in the face of the decline of an empire. The city may have died away, but it changed the world. Now you may be wondering, why? Why did they need to create a god? Reject centuries of ideology? What was it that pushed them to be so different? Well, the city itself was the reason. It came out of nowhere and then proceeded to be one of the most urbanized, and modernized sites in Mesoamerica. As you can see from this uh, city plan, it was a truly planned city, and some may want to argue that Monte Alban has shown inclination towards city planning, but even my advisor Richard Blanton has to agree it wasn't on this level. We see two massive 
roads dissect the site, the major orthogonal being the north-south avenue of the dead. And stemming from this, a gridded plan with nearly all the buildings oriented 15 degrees and seven min 17 minutes off of true north, following this very avenue. These people redirected the San Jose River to flow through their city, dividing the plan into a quadpartite design. But what truly sets Teotihuacan apart from other civic ceremonial centers is that the citizens selectively demolished and then rebuilt residential districts. These are apartment compounds that house tens of thousands within city limits. They were organized, even standardized to a degree. And we just don't see that kind of civic planning at Maya sites. And here's the knockout. You know what we don't see at Teotihuacan? Rulers. There's no evidence for one. No inscriptions. No stele. No tombs. Everything that is present and absent at Teotihuacan points to an egalitarian ideology, or, as Blanton and Farger have proposed, collective action. Both of which would have been in direct opposition to the Ahaz Regency in the lowlands. Teotihuacan rejected the established canon of jaguar iconography, instead choosing to create its own around the feathered serpent. Such changes do reflect shifts in thought and culture, but they are also propagators of that change. Esther Prastory was the first to propose that Teotihuacan art was a rejection of established Mesoamerican artistic canon rather than merely regional style. This polity was made up of immigrants, refugees, and locals. Associating the site with a single ruler might incidentally alienate some of those groups, or worse, preference some at the expense of others. And that would cause unrest in such a claustrophobic setting. So the solution was to avoid the individual entirely. The city itself was the symbol of the Teotihuacan body politic. And so I propose that the Teotihuacan stress their collective identity as a polity in order to forge cohesion among groups living within its limits. The citizens of the center used myth to form solidarity, it rallied behind the image of a specific deity that could stand for the whole of their new society that wasn't built off of previous rulers, previous centers. And that being was the feathered serpent. This was the god that claimed Teotihuacan and carried the entirety of its people. Teotihuacan made a visceral decision when it created the feathered serpent. They decorated their temples with its image and sacrificed in its name. They donned its image when they charged into battle. Teotihuacan was the place of the feathered serpent. And they made sure the rest of Mesoamerica knew that through public monuments decreeing their opposition to the jaguar. I hope that my talk has demonstrated how powerful art can be and that there are many ways to wage war. Thank you. If there are any further questions about my research, feel free to email me at this address or chat with me during the break.